All right, we've got two standards in unit seven, um, but this is one of our longer units because there's a lot of information packed into each of these standards. So even though it is just two standards, we do need to dedicate quite a, quite a bit of class time to covering these standards. The first one is 3.2.2, which is about offspring ratios. This might not mean too much to you right now, but as we go through this week and even after today, it'll mean much more to you. But this standard requires that students can predict offspring ratios based on a variety of inheritance patterns. So this includes dominance, co-dominance, incomplete dominance, multiple alleles, and sex-linked traits. We're going to talk about what all of that means between today, tomorrow, and even Wednesday. The second standard is 3.2.3, which is about the environment and gene expression. So students should be able to explain how the environment can influence the expression of genetic traits. So we've talked about this before. I mentioned it last week when we talked about biotechnology, but there's constantly an interplay between our environment and our genes. So at no point is, any one, is either one of them going to totally dominate the other. We're always going to see that, yes, your genetic makeup made you who you are from day one, and it continues to make you who you are, but your environment, meaning the circumstances you were born into, meaning the interactions you've had with human beings, meaning the opportunities you've had to learn, the opportunities you've had to grow physically, the opportunities you've had to grow emotionally, those things also contribute to making you who you are. And additionally, they can have an impact on your genes. If you've been exposed to specific chemicals, if you've been exposed to specific types of radiation, um, if you have used drugs, whether they were illicit drugs or prescription drugs, that can also influence how your genes are expressed. So it's not just your environment, but it's also not just your genes. It's not just your DNA. These two things are constantly interacting with, another, with one another to make you who you are. And we're going to talk about that later in the court or later in this unit. But as we know, we're a week into unit two at this point. I'm sorry, into quarter two. We're starting unit seven and we're at the beginning of a new week. So this is a great opportunity for you all to set some goals for yourself and to start working towards those goals. You are all achievers. You all did excellently in quarter one for the most part. Uh, but there's still room to grow, and I believe 100% in your ability to achieve that growth. As we think more about the EOC taking place in less than two months at this point, uh, we need to continue to review. We need to take things up a notch. We need to push the difficulty a little bit. I need to ask more of you. You need to ask more of me. But together, we're going to be in a great place to do well in the class and to do well in the EOC. So let's get it done, okay? If you don't know, this is Stacey Abrams. Uh, she ran for governor of Georgia in 2018. Uh, unfortunately, she lost, but it was the first time that a black woman was the major party candidate or was a major party candidate for that gubernatorial race in the state of Georgia. She's a rising political figure. So you might hear her name tossed around a lot over the coming years. If Joe Biden wins the presidential election, uh, then it's possible that she will be in his cabinet or a part of his administration in some role. So good person to know, Stacey Abrams. All right, per usual, we do have a warm up. So let's go ahead and knock that out. It is unit I'm seven, so sorry. day one. Were we supposed to start on our warm up? Cause I didn't start on it, I'm so sorry. No, that's fine, you can start now. We still have our normal six minutes. Um, you may, if you have, if you were already on our page, then you will likely have to reload it because I just uploaded the module about five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago or so. So reload the page if you have to. But it should be there.
Adrian, Olivia, Angel, and Anna. Dante, Alicia, and Gabby. Julian Castro, Kiki, and Amari.
Okay. So today is October 26, 2020, yet again. The title of today's lesson is Genetics. So please make sure that you are preparing to take notes for this lesson. You should always start by giving yourself a way to refer back to the lesson. So I encourage you to write down the title, the date, and Unit 7, Day 1. The objective of today's lesson is for biologists to be able to explain the connection between meiosis, protein synthesis, and genetics. And the essential question that we seek to answer, how does genotype affect phenotype? Two similar sounding words, we call them homophones, but they have different meanings. Okay. So genetics can be defined as the study of heredity. So it's the study of the genes that are passed on from one generation to the next. The genes that you receive from your parents do determine most of your traits. So even things as somewhat unpredictable as how tall you'll end up being are likely, or are largely, excuse me, determined by the traits, the genes that you receive from your parents. And we want to think about what genes are. Does anybody remember what the definition of a gene is, or can they just describe a gene very briefly? What is a gene? It's a hair such as like brown eyes or red hair. Okay, um, so genes code for traits like brown eyes and red hair. But when we think about genes as it relates to DNA, how, how, how could we describe the, that relationship? Or in other words, if we were to use DNA in the definition of gene, what would we say? How um the parents transfer the DNA to their right. offspring? Okay, kind of. That's the definition of genetics, essentially. I heard someone else take themselves off of mute. But thank you, Alicia and Castro. That's definitely in the right direction. Can you repeat um, what you, uh, yes. the question? Yes, so I'm just looking for, uh, well, here's the question right here. What is a gene? So I'm looking for a definition of a gene, but I'd like to hear the, the phrase DNA in the definition. Um, aren't genes like... Aren't genes like uh, made up of DNA? That's true, genes That's are made up of DNA. A gene is just a section of DNA. It's just a section of, gene, of DNA that codes for at least one protein. And those proteins will ultimately lead to the traits that Alicia talked about. So genes are small sections of DNA.
So if we were to take out the DNA that is inside one of your cells, that's in the nu nucleus of one of your cells, and stretch it out, it would be about two meters long, which is about six feet. Six feet long. But a gene would only be a really small section of that six feet, not even an inch. Because we have 30,000 genes in our DNA. So if we could split up that two meter long DNA into many thousands of pieces, then we along in those pieces have 30,000 different genes. So they'd be very, very, very small. And each of those genes codes for a specific protein or a class of proteins that leads to traits. Okay, so we've got to, we've got to keep in mind that genes are not the whole DNA, they're just small sections of DNA. Let's connect this back to meiosis. So let's see how much you all remember about meiosis. So meiosis is the process by which blank are created to be used for blank reproduction. Does anyone know this first word here? What is created by meiosis? or meiosis, or whatever you'd like to say. Um, gametes or sex Gametes, organs? gametes, good. Meiosis is the process by which gametes are created to then be used for what kind of reproduction? Asexual? Sexual reproduction. Good. A primary purpose of meiosis is to create blank cells, which have half the number of blank, the body cells. Daughter cells? Okay, daughter cells, yes. But these are specific types of daughter cells that have half the number. So what do we call those? Oh, haploids. Good, excellent. They're to create haploid cells which have half the number of what? They have half the number of plasma membranes or half the number of mitochondria. What should be there? Chromosomes. Chromosomes. Good. Okay, so you guys remember the basics of meiosis. Let's see if we can keep going. Before the chromosomes split during the cell cycle, homologous chromosomes exchange part of their DNA, a process called blank. What's it called when they exchange part of their DNA? This is anaphase. Okay, that does happen during anaphase. Good job. But this specific process, when they do, you see what, do we see what's happening in this picture here? where some of the pink goes over to the purple and some of the purple goes over to the pink. What's Crossing that? over? Crossing over, good. As the chromosomes separate during anaphase two, genes are randomly separated into blank daughter cells. How many? Four. Good, four haploid, and Ayana already gave us the haploid word. So four haploid daughter cells. Excellent job. Last one. The gametes, blank, contain only one set of chromosomes, which is half of the parent's DNA. Remember, sexual reproduction requires blank to make offspring. So what are gametes again? What are the gametes? Sex cells? Yes, and what are the sex cells? Can we be a bit more specific? That's 100% right, but what are they? Egg and, and sperm. Good, excellent. 
So the gametes, egg and sperm cells, contain only one set of chromosomes, which is half of the parent's DNA. Remember, sexual reproduction requires what to make offspring? What's it called when the sperm meet the egg in this picture? Fertilization. Excellent. Okay, so this process of meiosis is needed for sexual reproduction. Meiosis itself is the creation of egg and sperm cells. Each egg and each sperm cell is going to be unique. There are no other, there is no copy of it. There's no exact copy. They'll be similar, but they will be genetically unique. And this is why we call them haploid. They have half the number of chromosomes and they are unique. So this is what it looks like. This is what um, heredity looks like. Your grandparents gave half of their chromosomes, their DNA, to your parents. So grandma and grandpa for, gave half of their DNA to mom. Other grandma and grandpa gave half of their DNA to dad. Grandma gives 23, grandpa gives 23, mom has 46 in total. So parents are made up of their maternal and paternal chromosomes. Your parents will send a random single set of maternal and paternal chromosomes to you. So now you end up with a little bit of the DNA from your grandparents. And we just keep passing down like this. So each generation has a little bit from many of the previous generations. This is how sometimes you'll hear, you will hear people say, oh, you look like your grandpa. You look just like your grandpa when he was your age. Or um, you'll hear people say things like, twins skip a generation, stuff like that. Because there is literally a genetic link from you to your parents, to your grandparents, to your great-great-grandparents, to your great-great-great-great-great-grandparents, and so on and so forth. Some of that, just a little, the further back you go, there's less and less, but there is still some of the genes from your, your ancestors. Okay, so genetics, again, is the study of heredity, how genes are passed on from parents to offspring. Every individual inherits two copies of every gene. You get one from each parent. And each copy is called an allele, A-L-L-E-L-E. Each copy is called an allele. So you, you will always, always see alleles paired because you have two of them. You get one from mom and one from dad. Even if you don't call those people mom and dad, you get one from whoever gave birth to you and you get one from the person who provided the sperm to make you. We represent these alleles, which again, get paired, they stay in pairs. We represent them with letters. And these letters can be pretty arbitrarily assigned. For example, if we wanna talk about hair color, then I might use the letter H for hair, but there's no real science to it. <clears throat> so in this case, each allele gives a, results in a different trait. So my one allele with the capital B results in brown hair. Another allele with the lowercase b results in blue hair. We're gonna talk exactly about how to figure out the probability that a person would end up with brown and blue hair. It all depends on 
the alleles that are present, the alleles that are coming from mom and dad. So we're, what we're seeing here is that we've got the same genes. This gene codes for hair color, but that gene can result in two different traits. So I use different letters to represent those, those traits. Same gene, different result. Brown hair, or, or I guess this, was, this is eye color. Brown eyes or blue eyes. I guess nobody's really naturally born with blue hair, <laughs> but um, brown eyes or blue eyes. The reason we differentiate between the letters is because we refer to one of the alleles as dominant and the other as recessive. The capital letter represents the dominant allele. The lowercase letter represents the recessive allele. The dominant allele is quote unquote stronger than the recessive allele, meaning that the dominant allele, if it's present, is more likely to determine the trait. So if I have one dominant allele and one recessive allele, more than likely I'm going to have the trait of the dominant allele. The recessive allele gets overruled. It gets subjugated. This is why we call it dominant. Now notice here, I think it's gonna come up on a, yeah. I'll talk about it on the next slide. So, um, uh, can you explain the recessive alleles again? Uh, however you pronounce that? Yeah, allele, uh, it's kind of a hard word to say, allele. But um, recessive alleles, are just genetically less likely to determine how a gene is expressed. So keep in mind that these, these alleles are copies of the same gene. I get, one of, I get one copy from my mom, I get one copy from my dad. If my mom gives me a dominant copy and my dad gives me a recessive copy, then more than likely I am going to have the trait that came from my mom because she's got the dominant allele. Does that also work with, uh, that works with eye color as well, right? This, this is all of our traits. This works with every, this is every gene in our DNA. So yes, we talk about, you know, common traits like eye color and hair color, but this can be something as, as, uh, I guess, specific or minuscule as pro the protein that's on the outside of your cell. This could be something as specific as the type of red blood cells that you have. All right. So this is literally everything that makes up who you are, all of your traits, all of your genes. I have another question. What causes traits to skip generations? I ask this because my grandmother, she had hazel eyes and my grandma, her family, her on her side, her dad side of the family, they had blue, hazel, green eyes. And my mom, she got hazel eyes. And my brother, he's got hazel eyes, but it skipped over me and went to my brother. Well, I mean, you you and your brother are, even though you're older than your brother, your brother, you and your brother are in the same generation. So when we're talking about generations we're talking about parents and their kids those are those are two different generations so grandparents parents kids those are three different generations um, but you and your siblings are in the same generation this will make more sense when we look at um, when we look at some family trees and you'll literally be able to see the levels that exist on each um, family tree and each level represents a generation but uh, to answer your original question, most of the traits that we know about ourselves are determined by multiple genes. We call these polygenic traits. We're going to talk about them, I think, today. Um, um, and so, um, 
Is it possible to have um, a, a kid that looks exactly like you or close to looking exactly like you? Yes, it is. Now, you know, sometimes colloquially or just, you know, when we're just having a conversation, when we see that, when we see a child who looks exactly like one of their parents and nothing like the other one, we might say something like, oh, you've got strong genes. Um, the parent who looks like the child, oh, you must have really strong genes. But in reality, it's not that that parent's genes are stronger. All of this is, is basically random. Um, these, are, these are very random processes. So perhaps one, one parent has more dominant alleles than the other. Maybe one parent has a lot of recessive alleles, but this is all totally random. <coughs> so uh, a parent who has a lot of dominant alleles is more likely to give a lot of their traits to their children than the other parent. But there's no guarantee that a, that a parent, ha that one parent has more dominant alleles than another. They could both have a lot of recessive alleles. They could both have a lot of dominant alleles. So it could just, and it's just, it's just really a random process. Um, in some cases, people will choose to analyze their genomes um, to make sure that they are not putting their children at any risk for potential diseases, congenital diseases, genetic defects. Um, and in, in that case, you, you probably would be able to look at each of the genes and say, okay, your child is more likely to come out with brown eyes than blue eyes. Your child is more likely to come out with blonde hair than dark brown hair. When you can really analyze the genome that allows you to do that. Um, but even in that case, you can't say for sure what's going to happen because like we said, every sperm and every egg that's created via meiosis is, is unique. So you don't know which sperm is going to meet which which egg? You don't know what the specific genes present in that sperm are. You don't know what the specific genes present in that egg are. The only way to find out is when they actually are fertilized and you end up with a child. So this is all very, very random. Um, when we see people who have kids who look exactly like them, it may mean that they that the parent has more dominant genes, more dominant alleles, but um, it could also just be totally random because sometimes you end up with siblings who look nothing like parents and other siblings who look exactly like parents. Sometimes you have siblings who look nothing like either of the parents or they look more like an aunt or an uncle than they do their parents. So this process of genetics, you know, we study it, but there's no way to make a perfect guarantee that, oh, this child is going to uh, come out like this. We just say it's more likely. That it will that the child will have these traits. Okay. Um, so, allele pairs have three possible combinations. There are homozygous dominant alleles in which both, are, both of the letters are capitalized. We've got two dominant alleles. We call that homo because they're the same. We've got two of the same alleles. They're both capital alleles. They're both dominant. Same thing, we could have homozygous recessive if they are both lowercase or both recessive alleles. We still call it homozygous because they're the same, zygote, lowercase alleles. Heterozygous in this case, or in any case, is one of both. You've got one dominant allele and one recessive allele. Typically, we write the dominant allele first. So you should almost always have your capital letter first. Now, 
in the case of a homozygous dominant combination, then you will end up with a dominant trait. In the case of a homozygous recessive combination, you will end up with a recessive trait. But in the case of a heterozygous combination, meaning I have one homozygous allele, I'm sorry, one dominant allele and one recessive allele, then I'm going to end up more than likely with the dominant trait because that's why we call it dominant. It, it overrides the recessive trait. So heterozygous is almost always going to give you the dominant allele, the dominant trait. Any questions about that? So you all tell me, AA, is that homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, or heterozygous? You can just, you can just say HD, HR, or HE. HD. HD. What about CC? HE. HE, that's heterozygous. FF. HR. HR. E. E. HR. Oops. Bad. AG. H E. So we've got different here. We've got one capital, meaning a dominant allele, and one lowercase, meaning a recessive allele. So they're different. So this means it's heterozygous. Hetero meaning different. BB, what's this? There's what was that? H E. H E. Good. Then D D. H D. H D. G G. H E. Good. And the last one. H R. H R. That's recessive. Good. So it's important that we differentiate between the words genotype and phenotype. So when we use the letters to represent alleles, what we're talking about is a genotype. But we can also describe these traits based on their physical characteristics, and that's called a phenotype. I have a question. Never mind. Yes. Oh, I thought you went somewhere, but um, can you get your intelligence from your parents? Yes, you can. I mean, um, again, we have to have to emphasize that there is always going to be an interplay between your genes and your environment. So part of your intelligence is going to be determined by the genes that you get from your parents. And this is based on things like how fast do your neurons communicate between one another. But then also your environment is, and your experience is going to also play a role in your intelligence. If you are given better opportunities for schooling, if you have a greater affinity for reading, if you like to read more, um, if you're able to make 
connections between the, the activities that you like to do outside of school, and that could help you learn in school. So it's not just based on your genes, but it's also based on your experiences. It's based on um, the activities that you like to do. Some people, you know, simply don't like school, which of course makes it more difficult for them to learn. Um, some people really like school and they might have a really good teacher. And so that makes it easier for them to learn. But at the same time, we've got these biological traits that also affect how intelligent we are that determine, that, all, that help to determine how, how intelligent we might be. So good question. We've got to think about there always being some amount of environmental impact, but also a genetic impact. Some people literally have um, a brain chemistry that is more likely to result in them being quick learners or to result in retaining information better. Specific parts of our brain are needed to are needed for short-term memory and long-term memory. A person who is able to do both of those things well is more likely to have a greater intelligence. I feel bad for myself now. <laughs> but we also know that possessing a growth mindset and seeing yourself not as this fixed human being, but as someone who's constantly changing um, can allow you to get better at whatever you're trying to do. So, you know, at 14, 15, 16 years old, there's a lot of growth that still needs to take place. Your brain is still going to change for another 10 or 12 years. Um, and so keep that in mind as you, as you, you know, try to encourage yourself and, and stay encouraged. Okay. But the phenotype, again, is the physical description of the trait. The genotype is the genetic description using these alleles to describe the gene or the trait. Here's some images that kind of spell it out even further. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are quite a few of our traits, in fact, most of them, almost all of them, that are determined by more than one gene. There are very few traits that we have that are determined by any one gene. In the, in the documentary that we watched on Friday, we followed that young man, that, that, that kid who was uh, suffering from sickle cell anemia. So the sickle cell trait is one of few genes, or sorry, one of few traits that is determined by a single gene. If there is even one mutation in a specific place in that gene, then a person will have the sickle cell trait. But most of the genes, like the genes that determine your hair texture, your hair color, your skin color, your eye color, your intelligence, these are all determined by more than one gene and we call them polygenic traits. And this is what gives us such a huge range of outcomes. You know, when it comes to sickle cell, there are really three possible outcomes. Either you don't have it, you have the trait, which means that um, some of your red blood cells are sickled, or you, or you have it, meaning that almost all of your red blood cells are sickled, which can lead to, as, as we saw in the case of the young man, a variety of health um, issues. But most traits have a range, and we see a spectrum. There's a spectrum of skin color. There is a spectrum of height. There's a spectrum of weight. There's a spectrum of um, muscle tone. There's a spec spectrum of hair texture. And this is because these are determined by multiple genes, which results in multiple potential outcomes.
Wait, so you can carry the gene, but you don't actually have to have the disease? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's very common as well. Um, so this is why, again, so because of the advances in technology, couples can, uh, we saw a little bit about this in the documentary, at the very end of the documentary, they can go in for genetic counseling which means that they have their genome analyzed by a professional. That professional will then tell them, okay, you probably didn't know this, but you're actually a carrier of sickle cell anemia, or you are a carrier of Huntington's disease. And so because of that, the fact that you are considered a carrier, you don't have that disease, you don't have sickle cell anemia, but if your partner also has that same gene, if they are also a carrier, then it's possible that your child will have that disease. Doesn't mean it's going to happen. There's no guarantee that they will or that they won't, but it's possible because you're both carriers. Ms. Red? Yes. What causes your hair texture to change? I asked this because my mom, she said that her hair texture changed since she was born. Yeah, this happens often. In fact, many of you who have younger siblings or cousins and you were old enough to remember what they looked like as babies, you know that their hair is, uh, it typically starts off as pretty straight and very soft. Um, the reason for this is that babies produce different hormones um, and different chemicals. Their skin produces di different chemicals than uh, an adult's or even a young person's skin would. And so hair texture is ultimately t determined by the oils that are present in hair. Um, oils that are saturated, if your skin secretes saturated oils, then your hair is more likely to be straight. If your skin does not secrete those saturated oil, or if it secretes um, a different type of oil, which is unsaturated, then there are going to be kinks in your hair, and it will make it varying, varying amounts of wavy or, or curled. There will be coils in your hair. So um, as a person gets older, as their skin chemistry changes, and they produce different chemicals in their skin, then their hair texture can change as well. Um, we also know that some people, you know, treat their hair in specific ways using specific oils or using heat. Heat can break some of those, some of the chemistry in the oils that are produced by the hair, and it can result in your hair being straightened. You can do a chemical relaxer, which does the same thing, but um, it does the same thing. It has the same result as heat. Is applying heat to your hair, but um, essentially, it's just about breaking the breaking the, the the chemical bonds that are present in some of the oils in your hair. So, good question. All right. So, curly hair would that be considered a a phenotypic description or a genotypic description? Geno or pheno? Pheno. That's pheno, because that's a physical trait. What about AA? Is that geno or pheno? Geno. Geno. Greenish brown, would that be geno or pheno? Pheno. Pheno. Okay, you guys get this. Now, I don't want you to see these two as totally unrelated things. These are just two different ways of describing the same thing. Okay, so this is where it might start to get a little tricky for some of you. But remember, we've got two alleles. One of them is dominant to the other one. So in this case, purple, which is represented by a capital P is dominant to white, which is represented by a lowercase p. 
So two capital P's. Would that be homozygous dominant, heterozygous, or homozygous recessive? Homozygous dominant. This is HD. Good job. Homozygous dominant. So this is the genotype. What is the phenotype of a homozygous dominant gene? Purple flower. Purple, good. PP, one capital and one lowercase. Oh, okay, sorry, I went in the wrong order. Two lowercases, this would be homozygous recessive, which means that I end up with the recessive trait, the white flowers. Um, and PP, heterozygous, what, what trait would I get? Purple? I get purple in this case, yes, because purple dominates white. So if I have that purple allele, then I'm going to end up with the purple trait. All right. So light hair is recessive to dark hair. Again, the letters that you choose in your genotype don't really matter. The letters that you choose to represent the alleles does not really matter, or do not really matter, subject verb agreement. But if I've got a dark trait, then there are two potential genotypes that could give me that, that dark trait. What would it be? What would they be? What two genotypes can give me this, these two phenotypes? HD and HE. HD and HE, excellent. So I could be homozygous dominant, which would look like two capital H's, and I could be homozygous, and I could be heterozygous, I'm sorry, which would be H capital and H lowercase. But in order to have the recessive trait, of course, I need to be homozygous recessive. So that's the end of the lesson. This was supposed to be on Friday, so let's ignore this, uh, this GIF that I've included. <clears throat> there is an exit ticket today, and there is also a there's an assignment. It's called Basic Genetics Practice. So go ahead and knock that out. I think between the time we have left for the asynchronous portion of class and your brief lunch break, that should be plenty of time to knock out the asynchronous assignment. So go ahead and handle that. I will be here on mute to assist in any way I can.
Mr. Red? Yes. Um, I'm kind of confused on question two. I'm sorry, you're confused about what? Um, question two. Okay. It says that... Um, uh, are, you, sorry, are you talking about the basic genetics practice or the exit ticket? Um, the practice. Okay. It says that I got the uh, a number eight wrong when I chose offspring. Number eight? Yeah, for, uh, for, for question two. Uh, oh, blank eight. Okay, um, let me see. Uh, yep, that was marked incorrectly. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. I'm going to save this. Thank you as well, Olivia.
Okay, folks, it is now 1135, so you're good to go and start your lunch break. I hope you have a good rest of your Monday. Remember, give some thought and some time to thinking about what you want to achieve this week and start taking some meaningful steps towards that goal. Let me know if there's anything I can do to support you, and I will talk to you all tomorrow. See you. Uh, oh, wait, I heard tomorrow.